Good morning. I am excited to be sharing this morning. Let us pray as we delve into Matthew 6, 5 to 15 on prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us here today. I pray that as we look at this passage, that we may come with open hearts and listening ears for what you will share with us today. I pray that these words may be yours and not mine or Tim's. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <laughs> as Tim and I were talking and going through this passage to prepare for today, we discussed splitting the sermon into two separate parts. I will be looking at prayer posture and how it applies to my life and hopefully yours. Tim will then talk more to prayer practices. As I was studying this passage and I started looking at the postures of prayer, there were five key postures that I found helpful. The five postures we will be looking at today are glorifying God, seeking God's will, trusting God, repentance and forgiveness, and reliance on God. For those that are unfamiliar with the term posture, I am referring to the attitude of the heart. When we are praying, we should have an attitude of glorifying God. We should have an attitude of seeking his will. We should have an attitude of trusting God. We should have an attitude of repentance and forgiveness. And we should have an attitude of being reliant on God. The first posture... Okay, the first posture I want to look at is a, is a posture of glorifying God. Today, I feel we find ourselves surrounded by a world full of self-glorification. And it can be hard to navigate our heart's intent and serve God wholeheartedly when we try to fit in and find acceptance whether in friend groups or relationships that we have in our lives. There are many times in my life where I've tried to make myself look amazing and take credit for ideas or concepts that other people have come up with. Self-glorification. My heart was not one that aligned to Jesus' teaching in verse 5 and 6. Jesus says, do not be like the hypocrites, which in its context, Jesus is talking about those who, were more, uh, who thought they were more righteous than others and prayed on the street corners in public for self-glorification. Instead, Jesus taught his disciples to pray to the Father for his name to be glorified. This made sense to me when I understood this, as Jesus always teaches to give glory to his Father, who is our Father. And we should always want to be glorifying him. The second posture I want to look at is a posture of seeking God's will. I find it hard sometimes that... I find it hard sometimes to understand what God's plan is for my life and where I fit into the equation. I find myself getting lost in what I think God's will is and I find myself praying what I think God has for me. Two years ago, I put my resignation in because I felt like God wasn't doing what he had called me to do at the rural fire service. I was going to start working with my brother because that's what I thought was God's will for me. Then COVID hit. We went into another lockdown. I didn't know what I was going to do. 
I'd shot myself in the foot. I followed what I thought was right. A few days later, my boss called me into his office and he asked me, what are you going to do? I told him, I don't know. <laughs> but I know it's going to be hard because it wouldn't be easy to find a job. <laughs> then a smile appeared across his face. He pulled out my resignation letter and ripped it up in front of me. He said that he didn't submit it because he thought we would go into another lockdown. <laughs> in that moment, I felt God kicking me up the backside. <laughs> I wanted to believe that I, uh, sorry, I wanted to believe that what I wanted was God's will for me, but clearly it wasn't. I knew my heart needed to change. In verse 10, it talks about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are part of a greater plan in God's kingdom and a greater purpose. Sometimes we think that we know better. And it isn't till things come undone that we are reminded that he is in control. In verse 7 and 8, it talks about, and I'm paraphrasing here, when you pray, do not babble, for our fathers know what we need, our Father knows what we need before we need it. This is so true. <laughs> our Father knows what we need. But he wants a relationship with us. If we pray prayers full of babble, prayers that don't seek God's will, then we will never be content. God has given me numerous opportunities since to help colleagues at work. God has shown me how he is using me in this part of his will for me. And I only recognised it once my heart was aligned to his will for me, not mine. I need to be reminded that God has us where we are for a purpose when he is ready. Uh, sorry, for a purpose. And when he is ready for that to change, we will likely know because doors will open and other doors will close. But it all comes back to having a posture of seeking God's will. The third posture I want to look at is a posture of trusting God. In verse 11, it says, Give us today our daily bread. Sometimes it is hard to trust God every day. Different circumstances and situations roll into our life that can impact us to the point that we fail to trust God. And we think that we know better. Or we allow the world to influence how we deal with them. This was a challenging part of this passage to me because it made me question how I trust God daily. Working as an emergency service worker who is a first responder is a tough gig sometimes. And it has tested my trust and faith in God on several occasions. When I went to my first confronting job, it shook me up and made me question my faith. I was 20 years old. I'd been a Christian for five years. And what I knew of God's character was that he is love. I asked a question that I feel most people have asked at some point in their lives. Why would God let someone uh, why would God let something like that happen? Why would he let someone die in that way? I was so angry, frustrated and hurt by God. And I dealt with that trauma and grief in a way that I, that was not helpful. I took to alcohol 
because I was led by how the world deals with these issues. I let that be my comfort. I was at a mate's place later that year and I was still looking to alcohol to fill that void. <clears throat> that weekend, we had all had a fair bit to drink and I found myself in a dark place. I walked away from the group to get my mind, uh, sorry, to get some fresh air. But I'd gone away that weekend to my mate's place with my mind made up that it was going to be the last time I will ever have to feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I was going to end my life that night. But I got disturbed by one of my mates. And the opportunity was taken away. That was a real sobering experience. I heard God say to me, trust in the Lord your God and lean, on your not, your not, and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 1 to 6 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. I put my trust in the wrong thing, which led to a hardened heart full of anger, frustration and hurt, which then led to sin, anxiety and shame. I did not trust God daily to be my strength. Instead, I allowed myself to think that if I drank my sorrow away, it would suppress my anxiety and shame that I felt. But one step further, I thought that if I ended my life, I wouldn't have to deal with it at all. Something happened, though, that night. And I can only put it down to one thing. And that is because God loves me. God reminded me that he was always there. He reminded me that he is God and he has a plan for me. I recognise that I needed to put my trust in him daily because he promises peace, comfort and love. If we trust in God, he will put us on the right path and we will see him at work in our lives. We get to have a relationship that has no limits of how often we should pray or when we can pray. We can pray constantly and, trust, and a trusting posture reflects trusting God daily in all circumstances, big or small, in prayer. The fourth posture I want to talk about is a posture of repenting and forgiveness. One thing that I've learned about being a Christian is that if we are not careful, we can easily think that we are better than others. Whether they are our own brothers and sisters or non-believers. There are many times where I find myself being very judgmental and get caught up in my own self-righteousness. I've pulled up mates for doing things that I have done or was still doing while I was ridiculing them. 
1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I am a sinner, and I need to remind myself sometimes that I am a sinner. I am not perfect. I need to seek repentance because that is what is taught to us. When we look at verse 12 in Matthew 6, it says, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Similarly, in verse 14 and 15, it tells us, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you forgive those who sinned against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you don't, your Father won't forgive your sins. Sometimes it's hard to forgive people, especially when we feel so hurt by them. I need to remind myself, just as I am not perfect, neither is the person who wronged me. I must forgive as our Father first forgave me. I must show grace because it is grace that I first received and I do not deserve it. But God gave it to me because I am a child of him and you are too. The fifth and final posture I want to look at is a posture of a reliance on God. Verse 13 says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If I've learnt anything on my journey with God so far, (laughs) it is that although we are Christians, we still have times where we find ourselves in the depths of valley lows. And we will have times where we are on mountaintops where everything is great. Just like everyone else. Life isn't any easier for us because we are Christians. We have trials and we get tempted by what the world has to offer. What sets us apart from the world, though, is that we have God. And he asks us to be reliant on him. Our Father wants a relationship with us. Philippians 4.6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but pray, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Romans 8, 11 to 16 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If we are reliant on him, he will take all our anxieties, our stresses, and whatever the enemy is trying to use for evil, And God will use it for good, for his purpose, 
for his glory. God wants a relationship with us, a father-child relationship. We are his children and he cares for us. He wants us to tell him everything and let him be in control. We need to have a posture of being reliant on God. He has given us his spirit, which raised his son from the grave and brought life. We have that. Think about that. We have that spirit. And our Father is asking us to rely on him because we have something that cannot separate us from the love of God. To wrap up my part, I want to say these postures will take our human life to understand. And even then, we won't fully understand them until we see our Father face to face. Just to make it clear, I am still learning as we go through life together. But if we can try and align our hearts to these postures when we pray, I believe we will see and know God much deeper. I'll now hand over to Tim, who will continue. Awesome, Nick. Thanks so much for just challenging our hearts on how we approach prayer and how Jesus gave us the challenge through the Lord's Prayer. And yeah, so we thought as we break it up in these two sort of... I'll be less uh, time than, than Nick, I hope and pray. Um, and it's just, we've looked at the posture, this attitude, this character, the way we approach God in prayer... That's great and it it is good to reflect on, but now I want us to just dip our toes into the idea of the practice of prayer. So I want this to be a lot more practical, right? Because I don't want these things just to remain in the theory of prayer, but I want us to have a chance, and even now in these moments, to be able to think, how can I put some flesh on the bones? How can I get the rubber hitting the road in having a growing, healthy, maturing prayer life? Because as Karen has shared during her time in leading in the front end of the service, and as Nick has also shared, it's about cultivating a relationship, isn't it? And prayer, our conversation with God, uh, is a key way of us engaging in that relationship. So to that end, actually, this time around, um, I, I put out some handouts that I want to, uh, well, Nick's going to helpfully, and Lockie, if I look at it, uh, hand around, that is just going to look at these. I wanted to build on this. We'd already had this alliteration with the posture and the practice of prayer. I'm going to build on that a little bit in the practice of prayer because we're going to look at what it looks like to prioritize prayer, what it looks like to plan in prayer and what it looks like to persist in prayer. And then we're going to be overwhelmed with all the Ps, which P was where of posture and prayer and practice and persist and plan and all of the above. Put your hand up if you uh, need a pen as well. Uh, There's some pens to be handed out. But you know what? I mean, if you want to just type stuff into your phone, do that. Uh, Whatever it works, however it works for you, let's do that. So with our alliteration, with our P's in mind to hopefully remind us of how we can be a lot more practical in our prayer lives, I want to start with thinking about the need in our lives to prioritise prayer. Prayer is such an important ingredient in a healthy spiritual life. And we can't emphasize that enough. How key 
prayer is in, how, in having a healthy spiritual life, a, a healthy relational life with our Heavenly Father, and to be growing and maturing as disciples in Jesus. It's key, then, if we agree to that sort of collection of statements, that prayer is key, that it is important, then it needs to be something that we prioritise in our lives. It needs to be something that we take stock of in our lives and think. What are the things that I put in place in my life? What are the structures in my daily routine or my weekly routine that can implement having prayer as a part of that. So I've got space there on that handout because this is where I want, again, that rubber to hit the road, where I want that theory to become something a little bit more tangible because I know that in our lives, our lives are full, our lives are busy, there's always things going on, and yet... It's so important. We believe it in theory that prayer is so important. So it's important for us to make some practical rearrangements in our life to prioritize prayer. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. We can't mandate that. But I want through, I guess the conviction of God's spirit for God to be able to challenge perhaps what are the what are the things that you prioritize over and above having a structured prayer life or having at least some time dedicated to praying in your daily in your weekly routine whatever it looks like for you What can you change? Or what are the things that seem to sneak up above prayer? And you, you know what? There, there might be a raft of things because prayer might be right down the list of priorities for you. And I'm not judging you on that because I understand what that's like. And I wrestle with that as well. And just like Nick shared before, I'm sharing with you, I'm not coming here saying, I've got some fantastic level of prayer life and I've put all these into practice and I am on cloud nine and me and God are just super tight and he talks to me all the time and I talk to him, I give him advice and, you know, like I am not coming at you with any of that. It's a growing thing. It's a challenging thing. But you might come with a place where you're like, I'm not that interested in prayer. It doesn't ignite my heart. And so maybe to start with, maybe your prayer is, God, help me to have a heart for prayer. Help me to want to pray. Maybe that's going to be your starting point. God, help me to have a conviction to pray because I don't. Someone who I, I follow uh, online is a guy called Peter Gregg. I've spoken about him before. He's written a book on prayer, actually, How to Pray. He's also uh, a pastor over in the UK, and um, he is the um, founder of that Lectio 365 devotional material that I've spoken about before, and also a 24-7 prayer ministry. And I love what he says here in uh, this little quote. It's part of his Twitter bio. And he says this. Can I be honest with you? I'm actually not into prayer. I'm into Jesus. So we talk. I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God. So I ask for his help. A lot. 
Maybe you come at that place as well. To be honest with you, I'm not that into prayer. And I get that. But let me ask you, are you into Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Well, guess what? He's made the way and invited you in to talk. A real relationship. Our Heavenly Father has made it possible that we may boldly approach the throne of God. What a privilege it is. And we can talk. And it's all about God, isn't it? It's all about him and what he can do. It's not just that we are to the words. There is a mystery in the fact that God does listen to our prayers and he answers, but it's because his power is at work in all circumstances, not because of our power. But he invites us into this privileged place where we get to talk to God. We get to ask our questions. We get to pour out our heart. We get to... Ask for supplications and ask things of God. But we know we depend on him, we need his help. So we talk to God. Maybe a lot. When we look to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, what do we see and read about? In this one example, I remember in Mark's gospel, it says very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The thing that blows my mind is that this is Jesus, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity in perfect relationship with the Heavenly Father, and he has this desire and a need to go and meet with his Father and pray. And he prioritized that in his life of ministry. The gauntlet is out there. Jesus did that. He sought that out. Should we not also, right? And gosh, if Jesus felt he needed that, man, do we. We need that. So the first challenge is how can we prioritize prayer in our lives be active about this folks the second challenge in our practical ways of prayer is to plan for praying I, I sometimes have this romanticized idea that, you know, I'm just going to put some time set aside to, to be with God. I'm just going to pray and it's going to be amazing and like heaven's going to open and I'm going to hear angels singing and like a dove's going to ascend. It's just going to be intimate moment. Now, don't get me wrong. There can be amazing moments of just prayer, but you know what? It's really important and I don't think it's against the scriptures. We'll read in a second to actually have a plan of how you will pray. Tools that can help us and guide us in our prayer life so that when you do prioritize the time and you've got that set aside, that it's not just, okay, what now? But let's put some practical thoughts on that. Again, going back to another gospel in Luke's gospel. Do you remember there's a section that also has the Lord's Prayer in Luke's gospel, chapter 11, verse 1. The disciples came up to Jesus and actually said, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciples? Inherently in that, there is this idea that actually there's something to be learned about how to pray. That we can be learners of prayer and that it's worth seeking out some sort of rhythm, some sort of pattern, some sort of plan that can help guide us in our prayers. And in fact, when we look at this section in Matthew's gospel, right, we've just started in chapter 6, 
If you've got your Bible, you can look at it. And Martin shared about this last week. We've got three things. We've got giving to the needy, we've got prayer, and, we're finish- and it finishes off with fasting. And last week, Martin looked at uh, fasting and giving. Now, if you took the Lord's Prayer and you just like vacuumed it out of this section, you would get three very neat little pockets that are in a pattern of Jesus' teaching. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets, etc., etc., etc. But when you do, da da da, so your Father in heaven. That's about the giving. And then when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, etc., etc., etc. But when you pray, da 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 da. Go into fasting. So when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, etc., etc. But when you do it, da 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 da. There is this pattern of teaching that Jesus engages in. But for prayer, there's this intrusion. The pattern gets broken from these three. When you do, don't do that, but instead do this. When you do, don't do that, instead do this. When you... For prayer, Jesus says, let me help you with a bit of a plan on what you can pray. It's a very welcomed intrusion. It's not a bad intrusion. Matthew sets it up that way. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer, which can be a plan. And as Nick has shared with that posture, there's sort of five different brackets of of thinking about the Lord's Prayer. That's one way of looking through it and at it. But you might have heard of other prayer plans, the the ACTS model. Have you heard of the ACTS model? A-C-T-S with adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication. A-C-T-S. In the Lectio 365 devotion that I do uh, in, the, in the mornings, they work on the prayer acronym, P-R-A-Y, which is first pausing just to be still and getting your attitude right, getting that, that uh, posture of the heart right. Then the R is to reflect and rejoice through a psalm. Then the A in pray is to ask, and then the Y is to yield. And all those elements come out of what Nick was sharing about the postures of the heart as well. But it's worth seeking out some sort of devotional guide, some sort of prayer guide, some sort of plan that you can implement to help you when you've prioritised the time to then make it fruitful. It's good to plan things. I'm learning that more and more because I'm a little bit more of a hippie when it comes to this sort of stuff. I think, oh, it's all organic, it's all natural, just happen. But when you actually put things and plan things, then it can help you. Tim Keller, uh, when he was alive, wrote this tweet. The Lord's Prayer tells you in a nutshell what you should pray. But for him, he says it's the book of Psalms that teaches you how to pray. And Tim Keller has a good book on prayer. That might be a helpful starter. I've got a bunch of books, actually. I was going to bring them out here, um, uh, but I will. I'll bring them out afterwards on prayer. And maybe you want to pick up a book on prayer just to get encouraged about um, praying and to help jumpstart, kickstart your prayer life uh, so that you can try and have a healthy, growing prayer life. So our final P after we've prioritised a time in our life to pray, after we've put some sort of plan in place to help us know what to pray, like the disciples when they Jesus tell us how to pray, what to pray. Finally, I want to look at us being able to consider what it is to persist in our prayer life, to cultivate an ongoing prayer life, not just a, oh, I've ticked it off now, that's great, but a lifestyle of prayer, a real lifestyle of prayer, where you change it from just being something that you do when you gather on a Sunday, it's not bad, but that's fine, to a habit that is a part of your life. How can you ensure that you're making prayer a habit? Maybe it's having a prayer partner an accountability partner. Maybe it's having a prayer journal 
where you can write prayers down and, and you kind of make that a bit of a goal, part of a plan. It's not disconnected with that. What are some ways that you can find some consistency and be disciplined on that? These are spiritual disciplines that I'm trying to share here and that I'm being challenged with as well. In all of these areas, in having a prioritised prayer and planning for prayer and persisting in prayer, in all those areas, I've got a little bit of coin in each of the kitty of each of those, but those aren't full. I've got lots more work to do in each of those. But what are some ways that you can ensure or try to do your best to make prayer something that you grow in? Very Paul's this awesome verse in Thessalonians where Paul speaks about how you should rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Part of the will of God for you is to be constantly engaged with him in prayer. And there are other, circuit, uh, other um, examples in Scripture. I, I continually remember you in my prayers, Paul would say to Timothy, or to the church in uh, Colossians or Philippi. I can't remember one of the other ones. Constantly remember you in my prayers, giving thanks to God because of da 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 da. Again, this comes back to a posture thing, it's a heart thing. How do we set our internal navigation system and our spirit to be always attuned to focusing on God in prayer? We can chew gum and walk at the same time. So, what I mean by that is that. It doesn't mean that you have to constantly always be, dear Lord, I just thank you for da 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 dear. No, when you're at work, you're doing work stuff, but you can also be thinking, contemplating of the Lord, having him guide your thoughts, guide your heart in things. It works in the opposite, right? When we're really worried or stressed about stuff, that stuff infiltrates all the time, even while we're doing our normal day-to-day. As we practice some of those postures of the heart and get those right, we'll see ourselves changed and maturing where we are constantly actually in conversation with the Lord. Not always verbal, not always with the words, but just in presence of God moments. I've been trying to um, start doing some exercise. I've been trying to do some running and I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to be able to, when I'm running, put some headphones in, listen to some worship music and just pray to God. And actually, I kind of, in this one of these moments when I kept thinking, oh, I should be praying about that, I should be praying about that, I felt like the Lord just say to me, actually, just be with me in this time. Don't try and fill it, for me, in that moment, don't try and fill it with all this stuff. Actually, while you're doing that exercise, just be with me. I felt that was really lovely from God to just kind of go, I just want to spend time with you, just spend this time with me. Don't have to fill it with all words and petitions and stuff. And speaking of not only filling it with words and petitions, Peter Scazzaro, who is a pastor and author, he also tweeted this. This is where I get all my theological groundbreaking uh, stuff from these days, people, Twitter. A key indicator that we're maturing Jesus is that our prayer life has shifted from talking to listening. What an important part of prayer. Not just bring our thoughts, our prayer, and our adoration, and our requests and confessions to God. That's awesome. It's good, but... Also just remembering to be still and know that he is God. And allow him to speak in those moments. Sometimes we want answers from God, but we're, we don't give him the chance to speak. I don't know what you've written on your bit of paper and your hand out when it comes to prioritizing and planning and persisting in the practice of prayer with God. 
But before we sing our last song, I want you to spend a minute just praying over that now. Helping God to give you that conviction, how to do it, to the discipline to be able to put some of that stuff in place so that we can activate and grow in our prayer life with God, which is growing our relationship with him. And then we're going to sing our final song.